Welcome to this ACA Masters Audit and Assurance class. My name's Kieran Doe. I'm a senior tutor at ACA Masters. When I sat the ACA exams myself, I won ICAW prizes for financial accounting and reporting, audit and assurance, tax, financial management, business strategy, and case study, including the highest score in the world. I now teach the exam techniques and learning strategies behind the success to my students so they can achieve similar levels of success. During this class, I'll be working through an exam standard ACA professional level audit and assurance exam question so I can demonstrate how to score full marks in the risks and procedures question in the audit and assurance exam. This video has been designed specifically for our YouTube channel, but the content is taken from my audit and assurance video course. Throughout the class, you'll also see me refer to our audit and assurance materials, particularly the risks and procedures section where we have audit risks and procedures for each particular balance as well as some general exam technique guidance on how to approach these types of questions. Of course, our materials do cover every question type, but in this class, we will focus in specifically on the audit risks and procedures. So these are the sections that you will see me using. If you would like any further detail on my audit and assurance video course or on our materials, head over to the ACA Masters website and then go to the audit and assurance page, which you'll find under professional level. Here you'll find further details of the video course, including sample classes, and then also our study materials as well, where you can also find samples. We also find recent student feedback there, which is quite useful to review so that you can get an insight as to what other students typically struggled with and how they then improved their mark. So as always, I suggest looking at the requirement first of all. So we can see here, justify why the audit engagement partner has identified items one, two, and three as significant risks for the audit. So our typical audit risks and procedures questions, justify why the following items have been identified as risks. For each significant risk, describe the procedures that should be included in the audit plan to address those risks. Present your answer using the following subheadings. We've got revenue and receivables, plant and equipment, and provisions. And we've got 24 marks. So in these questions, what we'll typically have is some narrative, so usually a bit at the start of the question, which tells us kind of who we are and perhaps more importantly, who the client is, sometimes the type of their business. And we may be told some kind of general risks here as well. Maybe it's a new client or a first year audit. Maybe the directors get a bonus based on profit for the year. Maybe the business buys and sells in foreign currencies. So therefore we could see that we could have some general risks here, but we'd always be told kind of who we are and what the client does. And then we can see we've got the text on the various items, the various risk areas. Now sometimes and quite nicely we'll have kind of a heading for each. So that clearly kind of shows us the information which relates to each topic area although other times it might not be as kind of clear cut as this and then we'll be given some numerical information as well which of course we can see here so we've got the p l revenue cost of sales and gross profit that's obviously going to be useful when we look at revenue then we've got an extract from the sfp so we've got the current year and the prior year numbers so we've got extracts from the sfp showing trade receivables and plant and equipment as well. So we can see where we've got the financial information 
we need. So it's really important that we use all the different pieces of information that the examiner has given us. So we can see we've got like narrative information here and there'll be risks in here. We'll be able to justify why revenue and receivables is a risk based on the information here, but also from the numbers as well. So really important that we use all the different pieces and types of information that the examiner has given us, both the narrative and the numerical. So I'd have a look at high level look at the question just as, a, as I have done there looking at the information uh, that we've been provided and thinking how we might approach the question obviously when it's nicely dissected like this we can just read this revenue and receivable section uh, and then attempt you know this part justify why revenue receivables is a risk um, and then we can move on and read the plant and equipment section and look at the numbers of plant and equipment and justify why that is a risk so you can break the question down the examiners almost always lay the question out in a really friendly way so you can kind of dissect the question down you know it's not as though that we're going to work through this information here and then you know right at the end there's going to be something which completely changes our answer to the first part they're not trying to trick us in the way that they kind of like lay the question out you know, they're trying to uh, make it as friendly as possible uh, in terms of the way that they lay the questions out and that applies to all of the ACA exams so we know that we're going to be able to attempt kind of each part effectively in isolation but there might be some bits that we read um, that relate to two different parts so we could think about our mark allocation and then we can do our time allocation based on that if you take the uh, amount of time you've got for the paper the number of minutes divided by the marks then of course you get number of minutes per mark for the exam so then we would need to kind of estimate how much how many marks we should allocate to each so that we can allocate our time to each so of course maybe your default position would be okay we've got 24 marks we've got three sections so maybe i'll allocate kind of eight marks each and then multiply that by my minutes per mark my 1.5 minutes per mark or you may look at this if you look at it in a bit more detail we can see there is a lot for revenue and receivable there's more there than perhaps the others so you might want to allocate a bit more time to this so maybe we could go like 10 marks for revenue and receivables and then do seven for those two so that we could have our uh, estimated mark allocation so we know how long we're going to spend uh, on each part and then we could do our amount of time we're going to spend on uh, each section based on that and then we know kind of roughly how long we'll spend and you might want to allocate a little bit more time to the first part if there is a bit of information a bit more information we need to read through at the start that doesn't seem to be the case here so then once we have done our mark allocation we can then start to read through the scenario and start thinking about the audit risks that we can see. So your firm is the external auditor of Custom Carpets Limited, CCL, so the name's perhaps a bit of a hint into what the business does. And you are the senior responsible for planning the audit of the financial statements for the year ended 31st of December, 22. So that could be important, particularly if you're thinking about things like cutoff or if you're having to kind of calculate uh, any numbers. So your firm has audited CCL for many years. So therefore, this isn't a first year audit and we're not going to have perhaps one of those general risks about it being like a first year audit and then work we might need to do it over the opening balances, as we've seen in other questions. The audit engagement partner has classified the following as significant risks for this audit. And then, of course, we've got the three areas there, so we're well aware of what they are. So, of course, we know for this question that we're going to have a section for each. We're going to have you know, revenue uh, and receivables, and then we could have our audit risks uh, and uh, procedures. 
as we go through and then we can have uh, you know, our audit risk in here and our audit uh, procedures uh, in here. So you could even title those up first of all, but we're very clear to the examiner what we're doing. And this is a good way to lay it out. So in a word processing area, you can set up a table. So we'd have our risks and our uh, procedures. And then we could just take it one at a time. So we'd have revenue receivables and we'd have our plant and equipment, et cetera. So then we're told, we start to be told now a bit more about what the business does. So it's always very important to kind of understand what the business does, because uh, that will kind of help us if we understand you know, the business, kind of what it does, the type of industry it's in, uh, as well as its systems, you know, that will help us kind of identify risks and amounts we might expect to see and the types of transactions we might expect to see in the financial statements. So CCL manufactures and installs carpets and rugs for businesses and individuals. So it's a manufacturer, so you'd expect it to be quite capital intensive. You'd expect them to have a lot of uh, non-current assets, so like PPE uh, on the SFP. And of course, we've kind of seen that there. There is a, a substantial amount there of PPE. So manufacturers are going to have like the machines, etc. Installs carpets and rugs for businesses and individuals. So maybe we'll have a breakdown of the amounts they supply to businesses and the amounts they supply to individuals. Uh, you know, maybe there's, there's different terms in those credit terms. We're looking at receivables, for example. So all products are made to order and customers create their own design on the CCL website. So maybe we'll see something about intangible assets if they've got a website and they've you know recently uh, developed it or enhanced it. So made to order, uh, customers create their own design on the website. So once a customer creates a design and places an order on the CCL website, the product is manufactured at CCL's factory before being delivered and fitted at the customer's premises. So the customer creates a design, places an order on the website, it's then manufactured at CCL, so they've got their own factory before being delivered and fitted at the customer's premises and then they're delivered and fitted to. I think it's good to kind of visualize what the business does because that's going to help us understand like the processes in the business and that's going to help us you know, identify any perhaps weaknesses in the processes in the controls. And also um, if we understand what the business does, that could help us you know, identify particular risk. And when we're thinking about our audit procedures, if we understand like, the process and the flow in the business, we can think about sensible audit procedures that we could come up with in order to provide audit evidence that amounts are, whether amounts are materially misstated or whether they're materially correct. So the customer places the order on the website product is manufactured at the factory and then it's delivered and fitted at the customer's premises. So these could be businesses or individuals. So the average time between the initial order being placed by the customer and installation at the customer premises is two months. So the average time between the customer placing the order and then it being you know, like delivered and fitted so installed at the customer's premises is two months. However, this can be longer during the busiest times of year, such as December. So the customer places the order, but it actually isn't, you know, by the time it's been manufactured and delivered and fitted in their premises, it's two months. And this can be even longer during the busiest times of year, such as December. And of course, we know that's the company's year end. So it could possibly be uh, an issue of you know, cutoff here if they're depending on how the revenue is recognized and depending on amounts which are received at that time of year so we're going to need to find out some more information about kind of when payment is made etc but it certainly seems as though that's the busiest time of year and of course we'll need to be clear when the last kind of installation was because that would be the last transaction that should be recorded as revenue in the current year and then of course in Installations after this date would, of course, be recognized as revenue in the following years. But if we find out when payments are, we could see kind of what the, the risk would be and how revenue is recognized. So we're told once the products have been delivered to the customer, the finance team raise an invoice and the accounting system automatically records the associated revenue and receivable. So once the products have been delivered to the customer, finance team raise an invoice 
so the request for payment to the customer and the accounting system automatically records the revenue and receivable so it's important to kind of think back to your far your accounting knowledge here and think kind of you know is that correct so when would revenue be recognized if we've got a company who is supplying so manufacturing delivering and fitting carpets you know, when would they recognize the revenue of course we know under ifrs 15 revenue recognized when the performance obligation is satisfied and that's when control is transferred to the buyer and with goods that's usually indicated when the goods are delivered so when the goods are delivered that's when the revenue is recognized and that seems to be you know, correct and that seems to be in accordance with you know ifrs 15 unless we're told a perhaps more unusual circumstance like legal title you know transferring before then or something like that and you know we're not being told that here and we're not going to get particularly complicated revenue recognition issues in the aa exam so this seems correct you know goods are delivered and you know, that's usually when control transfers and the performance obligation is satisfied and that's when the revenue is recognized so that seems correct of course we've already identified as a potential cut off issue here particularly with like deliveries around like the year end we need to ensure that the last delivery for the year is recognized as revenue in the current year but any deliveries you know after the year end would of course be recognized as revenue in the following year standard payment terms for both business and individual customers have always been 30 days from the date of invoice so this is when the payment terms are so they deliver the goods raise the invoice payment is due 30 days after so that's going to be quite useful when we look at our receivables because we can look to see whether those receivables days are in line with that if not if they're more than that that could indicate uh, an overstatement of receivables or possibly an understatement as well depending on whether they're higher or lower than the usual standard credit terms however from the 1st of october 22 so three months before the year end ccl's payment terms for individual customers changed so that 40 percent of the order value is payable when the order is placed so they sell to businesses and they sell to individuals so they've changed the term selling to individuals so that 40 percent of the order value is payable when the order is placed so usually what happened is customer did design placed the order it got fitted and then they would pay within 30 days of the invoice that has now changed so that when a customer places the order they pay 40 percent up front and then the remainder is due 30 days from the date of invoice as usual so now from october ccl has been receiving payment from the customer before they've actually delivered the goods and of course that would potentially create a risk of overstatement because if they receive the cash and they record it initially as revenue then of course that would be incorrect as we've already said you know, under ifs 15 the revenue should be recognized when the performance obligation is satisfied i.e when the goods are delivered so if we do see a potential overstatement in revenue this could be the reason why and of course again if you think back to far exam questions that's quite often the mistake that the accountant makes isn't it if you think back to those explain questions the mistake the accountant often makes is you know company receives payment from the customer you know in advance and they immediately record it as revenue but of course as we've said that isn't correct under ifs 15. so the carpet manufacturing industry has faced increasing scrutiny about the sustainability of its operations so kind of a, an industry-wide thing uh, scrutiny about sustainability Whilst none of CCL's products are currently recycled, several of CCL's competitors have recently launched fully recyclable products, and these have been well received by customers. So competitors have launched recyclable products, and these have been well received by customers, so therefore they seem to be quite popular. This has contributed to the number of orders placed during the year ended 31st December 22 declining to 10,200 and they were 10,900 the year before so CCL is 
its competitors have launched innovative new products and that's resulted in a fall in the number of orders for CCL. So again, we've obviously got some more numbers here. This is provided in the, the scenario, you know, the examiner has obviously provided this for a reason. We want to try and use this in our answer as well. So we've got quite a bit going on with revenue. We've identified some you know, potential reasons why there could be an overstatement here. We've got some more numbers to work with, you know, based on this, what we know about what's going on in the, in the industry, we'd probably expect revenue to be falling. You know, number of orders has gone down, competitors have launched uh, more popular products. Therefore, we would expect that revenue would be falling. But of course, we're only really going to know when we look at the numbers and straight away looking at the numbers, it looks as though that they have increased. So as I've said before, you know, we need to make sure we're using the numbers and the narrative as much as possible. So really, we're only really going to know if there's a risk of overstatement or possibly understatement when we really start to have a look at the numbers. Um, so we can use the uh, spreadsheet area to start looking at some of the numbers. We can look at kind of the change in absolute terms and the percentage, but quite straightforward here. So we've got uh, so 18, 18.3 million of revenue. And we can see how that has changed. And we can see, of course, it's been like a 10.9% increase in revenue. So we've seen that increase in, in revenue there. Um, so yeah, that would, it's kind of different than what we would perhaps expect. You know, we would expect, of course, that you know, revenue would have uh, declined um, because we, of course, knew that there had been the competitors launching the new products. So that's kind of surprising. And that would indicate a potential misstatement. You know, revenue has increased when we'd have expected it to have declined. Now, another way to judge whether this indicates overstatement is look to see how cost of sales has moved. Because you would expect, you know, in most businesses that, you know, revenue and cost of sales would move broadly in line with each other. Of course, cost of sales could include a high proportion of fixed costs. And maybe in a business like this, like a manufacturer, you know, maybe that is the case. And therefore, you know, they've got higher operating gearing. So a higher proportion of fixed costs to variable costs. And therefore, when like, volumes increase, then you know, revenue could increase quite significantly. But cost of sales wouldn't increase by as much because of course the majority of the costs are fixed. So, you know, it wouldn't always necessarily definitely mean that there's an overstatement. You know, it could be reasons why revenue would be going up more than cost of sales. Um, and another way to look at effectively the relationship between cost of sales and revenue is look at changes in the gross profit margin. So of course, if revenue is going up faster than cost of sales, then obviously we're going to see an increase in the gross profit margin. And of course we can, uh, see that here the gross profit margin has increased so definitely you know when you're looking at reven revenue look to see how revenue you know is increasing year on year but also you know compared to cost of sales you know which is effectively looking at the movement in the gross profit margin and we can kind of see that there so that definitely would indicate that there is uh, an overstatement of revenue um, because we the fact that the number of orders has gone down, you know, you'd expect revenue to, to go down. So if you think about, you know, revenue, how revenue effectively calculated, if you think if you broke revenue down, you can basically break it down between like volume and price. So we know that the number of items that they sold this year was 10,200. Of course, we're working in thousands here. These numbers are in thousands. So this is you know, millions of revenue, 18.2 uh, million of revenue. So 10.2 thousand orders this year, 10.9,000 orders in the previous year. So therefore you can see like the like average price per order, you know, if they've sold this many units, uh, then the effective kind of like average price is this. So that's gone up quite significantly. The total revenue is you know, number of units sold times by you know, the price per unit. <laughs> So we can see that you know volume has declined, but it looks as though like the average order value has therefore increased significantly. And of course it would do. If volume's gone down, then that increase must be because of price. Um, so again, yeah, that could possibly be plausible, but that's probably something we need to uh, discuss with management there. But it certainly does appear as though there's 
you know, a risk here because, you know, revenue has gone up, you know, significantly uh, because of like an increase in the average price per order. We know, you know, why might revenue have, have gone up? We know that like, commercially there doesn't appear to be a reason why. We know that their customers have been going more to competitors. So that's not what we would expect to see based on what we know about the business and the industry. And then also we know that the company has been receiving or has started to receive payment in advance of products, which it hadn't received in its part in the past. So therefore you know, we know, of course, the correct entry for that, if you receive a payment in advance would of course be, you know, they've received cash. So that's a nice, easy one, debit cash. We know that should under IFS 15, you know, go to contract liability until the performance obligation is satisfied. You might have heard this referred to, of course, as you know deferred income uh, in you know your earlier exams. But the correct terminology under IFRS fifteen is uh, contract liability. But you know it's the same; it's still a liability until the performance obligation is satisfied, until the goods are delivered, and then they would like credit the contract, uh, then, then they would debit the contract liability, and then they would record record the revenue, but only when the goods are delivered. So, of course, we know if by mistake, if they were instead you know, debiting cash, but instead crediting those deposits straight to revenue, you know, that would cause the overstatement. So therefore we could see why there could be the overstatement there. So it's clearly a risk from the scenario now that they're receiving payment in advance. And of course we can see it from the numbers as well. You know, an increase in revenue and an increase in the you know profit margin as well. The costs haven't gone up, but you know revenue has. So maybe they're receiving these payments, recording them as revenue. They haven't even started manufacturing the goods yet, so they haven't even got the costs yet. It's probably going a little bit too far for the AA exam. And given the time constraints we've got, you know we haven't got ages to spend on this issue. We want to get through every issue and get like the easy and medium points on each so we can rack up our marks. It's very possible to get full marks on this question. So we need to make sure we attempt everything. But you could even possibly look at and see, you know, based on the orders, if you kind of prorated it for seasonality and then took off the 40%, you know, would that explain the increase? Although I guess then we haven't actually got the the split between uh, business uh, businesses and individuals. So clearly we can see from the numbers that there's a risk of overstatement. And we know from the scenario as well, that there's clearly a risk of overstatement. So kind of quite clear there where we would have that risk of overstatement. So we start off with uh, our revenue and it's really important when we, think about structuring our points in this exam you know as i've said you know really important we use the scenario and the narrative but make sure you're kind of clear you know, is it a risk of understatement or overstatement you know make sure you make that kind of very clear to the examiner so we could say there is a risk that revenue is uh, overstated uh, because and that's kind of like the key key word really you know you always need to explain why so there's a risk of overstatement so be clear is it a risk of overstatement or understatement where you can and then say why so why is there uh, a risk of overstatement so we could say we could start with the numbers first of all so we could say you know because revenue uh, has increased uh, by 10.9 percent so that's obviously like a, a large increase so it's increased by more than uh, is increased by 10.9%, uh, which is more than increase uh, in cost of sales. So like I said, you could kind of do it like that. It's more than increase in cost of sales. Uh, and you could put, you know, gross profit margin increase to, so 32.8% from the 28.1%. So that's uh, how the gross profit margin has increased, which, as I've said, is effectively just saying you know, revenue's gone up by more than cost of sales. And you expect them generally to move in line with each other. You know, companies don't generally see large movements in their um, gross profit margins year on year. I mean, they could do. There need to be kind of a reason for that. We need to identify the reason for that. You know, having high fixed costs would be one of those if volume has then increased. Or a change in you know, pricing strategy, perhaps, or a change in product mix, more premium products. So it could be commercial reasons why, but you know, if there's been a large increase and there's nothing explained in the scenario as to why, then of course that would indicate a risk. Perhaps we kind of look at stable business like this, like a carpet and rug manufacturer. And particularly if the business is under pressure from competitors, you wouldn't expect to see an increase in the profit margin. 
So there's a risk that revenue is overstated because revenue's gone up by this, cost of sales has only gone up by this, and therefore you know, gross profit margin has increased. Um, and you could say, you know, this is you know unusual um, because so we said it was unusual uh, because you know number of orders uh, has decreased uh, by you could work out the percentage there isn't going to take make much difference here so average uh, orders have decreased by six point four percent you know due to uh, competition. Um, so you can see there you know, how we could just kind of tie those different you know numbers in and how that's kind of different than what our expectation you know would be. That's kind of like the analytical uh, procedure we've performed, and that's quite you know clearly the the results are different from our expectation. Um, so number of orders is decreased. You could even say you know so we would expect to see a decline in revenue there. So that's kind of using the numbers. I mean, we could go on and on. And there's lots of reasons why. I mean, you could even split it up. You could say, you know, we're going to have lots of reasons and maybe we want to kind of separate them out. So it's a risk of overstatement because, and then one reason is because, you know, revenue has increased. Of course, we have seen as well that they received a 40% upfront. So, you know, CCL, you know, now receives uh, 40% of payment uh, upfront when order uh, placed. Um, so you can say payment up front when all the flash, you know, before goods delivered. Um, so which may lead to premature revenue recognition uh, because they should only uh, be recognized or uh, because revenue should only be recognized when performance obligation satisfied. Uh, and then we could say here, um, you know, control uh, transferred. So you can see here how I'm kind of using my uh, accounting and FAR uh, knowledge here to help. And of course, you know, don't worry too much about typos in your exam. As long as the examiners can read it clearly, uh, then that's fine. You know, I think all of those are fine. It's quite clear. I mean, control is a bit of a bad one to have misspelt there. But, you know, don't spend too long kind of going back and recorrecting all your typos in the exam. As long as it's clear, you know, that that's fine. And you can kind of see here, you know, when we're doing this is you know, say whether it's an overstatement or whether it's an understatement, uh, you know, using the numbers, but using the scenario as well as we've done, you know, receiving payment in advance, you know, using the numbers uh, that we have calculated here from the scenario. And also, you know, don't be shy about using your, you know, accounting and FAR knowledge to identify the mis misstatements. So, of course, you know, there could be a misstatement in the accounts for various reasons. You know, the revenue might be misstated. Uh, because of incorrect accounting treatment. And of course, you're very familiar with that from those explain the accounting treatment in FAR questions. Just think about what does the you know, the junior accountant in there usually do wrong or even the FC and the FD at times. But it could also be because um, of you know, incorrect or, or poor internal controls uh, as well. So it isn't always for like a technical accounting reason, but quite often it is. And therefore it is useful to think like that. Um, so as we said, you know, revenue should be recognised when the performance obligation is satisfied, and they're now, they're now receiving payments uh, in advance. So that could, of course, result in revenue being recognised prematurely, as we said there. You know, rather than crediting contract liability that like they should initially and then only record it when the goods are delivered, maybe they're receiving these cash deposits and recording them straight as revenue, and that would it kind of explain why revenue has increased and that would of course be a misstatement because it shouldn't have been recognized so when you are thinking about risk it can be useful to think of the financial statement assertions um so if you think about you know one particular one you know particularly with um or any amounts in a PL really but certainly with revenue kind of a risk of cutoff and we've kind of seen that here because we were told that busiest times of year are December. So busiest times of year is around the year end, 
we know that revenue should only be recognized when the goods are delivered and we're told that once the goods are delivered you know that's when the invoice is raised and the accounting system records the revenue but of course you know, around this time of year you know, people could be off work it's very busy uh, it's not kind of quite clear how the finance team know when the goods have been delivered is that kind of a communication from like the, the delivery drivers you know we're not sure exactly but you can kind of see around this year end how maybe you know as we've said you know at the end of december on the 31st of december you know the last order there you know that's the last the last delivery on that day is the final transaction that should be recorded as revenue there'd obviously be a risk that maybe like some deliveries were delayed but the finance team would have thought they had been rec- delivered uh, and therefore you know raised the invoice and you know recorded the revenue so clearly there would be a kind of a risk of cut off here so again using the scenario so lots of deliveries uh, at year end increases risk that revenue recorded in incorrect period and it could go both ways as well couldn't it you know maybe there are some um the goods delivered before the year end uh, but you know the people in the finance team are away and you know therefore nobody raises the invoice until they get back and it's recorded in the following year so it could result in revenue being uh, understated as well as overstated um but yeah lots of deliveries around the year end result could result in revenue being recorded in the uh, incorrect period uh, and you could say you know because only goods delivered by year end should be uh, included and we've kind of already explained that above you know that's when the control is transferred that's when the performance obligation is satisfied as uh, so we kind of said you know maybe we'll kind of go for about like 10 marks on on revenue so the fact we've got kind of got like you know, f- three or four really good um you know, risk there should be enough before we get on to our procedures we may even get kind of a couple of marks for some of those because they're really good we use a few analytical procedures and use the order numbers there probably get a couple of marks for that one and maybe even a couple of marks for, for some of these as well these are really good identifications of risk because i'm using the numbers i'm using the narrative from the scenario kind of combining them together using some financial reporting knowledge and explaining why the accounting treatment there is incorrect but you could probably think of uh, some more as well, but always thinking about the ones which are most relevant to the scenario. And I think kind of visualizing what the business does and visualizing almost it's like uh, systems and processes kind of really helps here to identify, you know, what could go wrong. So I'm kind of just imagining this business, which is manufacturing carpets uh, and then you know, driving them out to, or even before that, you know, the customer going to the website, you know, doing a, design made to order design order gets sent to you know, the company um then they manufacture it in their factory as you can imagine like the ppe in there you know it takes a few months to do it and then it's delivered so dri- driven to their door dropped off at the customer's house you know, fitted i guess that's more of a carpet i guess than a rug uh but you know carpets would be you know fitted um and then of course when they're actually when they've actually been delivered um that's when the finance team uh, raises the invoice in the accounting system and then it's credit revenue debit receivable and then payment is made kind of 30 days after that but of course there's this change now that when the customer goes to the website first of all and places the order they start re- receiving 40 percent you know up front so i think if you can kind of just imagine kind of what the system looks like how things are recorded and then you can start to think you know where there would be the risks and obviously using the scenario uh, as much as we can as we have done here and then that kind of almost like visualization understanding of the customer systems is really going to help us with our audit procedures so you know we are trying to keep them tailored to the specific scenario i know there's a, a temptation among students to think oh, i've done loads of questions on revenue before i've learned lots of procedures and i'm just kind of copy the same ones out it looks as though the same ones come up time and time again and of course you know generally the procedures that can be undertaken around revenue can be quite similar among businesses uh, but you always need to tailor them to the specific business and not every procedure you've ever seen for revenue is going to be applicable to the business in your exam so you have to kind of think quite carefully about which procedures are relevant you know one of the things we've said first of all is looking at the high level numbers is that revenue has gone up significantly compared to cost of sales 
and that sort of course caused the gross profit margin to go up. And we've said, you know, that looks unusual when the business is facing like competitive pressures. But of course, I have said, you know, there could be a commercial reason for that. You know, maybe, for example, they've decided to increase the prices. Maybe they've run lots of like new commercial clients and there's like an, a higher than uh, average you know, order price. Um, maybe they've managed to like reduce costs uh, in some way by being more like efficient in terms of production. There's lots of reasons why, valid commercial reasons why this could have happened. It doesn't necessarily mean there's been a misstatement in this number. So of course, you know, who would we go to to find out what's going on in the business commercially to identify if there is a commercial reason for this? Well, of course, it would be the directors of the company. They're the one managing the business day to day. So we could then go to the directors and ask them. So even though usually when we're thinking of our procedures, you know, usually we prefer an independent source rather than the client, of course, because, you know, an independent source is uh, perhaps more objective. So even though we may prefer uh, an independent source, sometimes you know, asking the directors, asking management are the best people to ask. So we could like inquire with management to establish the commercial you know, reasons why that has happened. So you know, inquire with management to establish commercial reasons uh, why so that kind of goes in really well with that. Uh, procedure that we have there but let's keep it really specific so so you can say maybe for example price increase uh, higher value orders so even though you know some of these procedures are in some way kind of universal or definitely apply to lots of different scenarios you know, always make sure you're tailoring them to the specific scenario and think would that actually help you identify whether there is a misstatement or not you know if management come back and say oh yes we've changed our pricing policy prices are now higher we're targeting more businesses larger businesses and therefore that's a higher uh, order price and then we could even take that even further and then we could get like a breakdown of orders uh, to see if you know, more orders are now to commercial clients and if the average value is now higher so clearly yeah that would definitely be relevant to this business again you could kind of like review budgets and forecasts to see if revenue um is higher than what they expected you know maybe they this was a part of a new commercial strategy they launched at the start of the year and therefore the budgets had these numbers in it and that's what was expected so again you could review those budgets and forecasts to see if the revenue is higher than expected Um, we could get a breakdown, so by region, product or service. So that depends on the business, you know, how, what you want to get a breakdown of. But we said you could get, you know, obtain breakdown uh, between you know, individual and business customers uh, to see if one type of customer is causing the increase. So of course, you know, we could get a breakdown between the two and that'd help us to see if there's one particular type of customer that is causing the increase. So we thought about some sensible procedures which would kind of help us understand whether there's like a commercial reason for the change in the revenue and the increase in the profit margin. One of our other kind of areas of risk that we've identified or another reason why we think revenue might be overstated is of course because the they now receive 40 percent of the payment up front and therefore it appears as though they may have been recognizing that as revenue so therefore we can think about what audit procedures could we undertake to see if that's the case now when we have and when we're looking at a scenario where they received a the payment in advance and of course one thing to do would be just to recalculate the revenue that should have been recognized so we could say or even you know recalculate um revenue uh, that should uh, have been deferred or you know recognized as a, as a liability as a contract liability recognize that the revenue should have been that should have been deferred so of course you know as i said that's a good source of um audit evidence because it's being generated by the auditor so generally with our procedures you know think about like the action that we're undertaking so this time it's like recalculate 
uh, you know, the source that we're going to be using. So, you know, how would we recalculate the revenue that should have been deferred? Well, we could use uh, a combination of the bank statements, because of course we said they'll receive the deposit, they'll record that in the bank. So you could set, uh, recalculate revenue that should have been deferred using uh, bank statements. And um, we could also look at goods delivered notes to see if the goods had actually been delivered and ones that hadn't and we could calcul calculate the amount that would be deferred so we can see how much they've received in the bank and then we can see you know how much of that should have been uh, deferred so using bank statements and goods uh, delivered notes and we'll think a bit more about the sales system in a minute and how we can uh, use that and how that's probably working at this client so think about the action that we're undertaking, the source, and we can think about the purpose, you know, what would that help us, you know, confirm? And it can be useful to, again, think about the assertions here. You don't always need to say which assertion that we're thinking about here. But of course, this would, you know, help us um, to confirm that the payments have been classified correctly, that they have been correctly recorded as revenue, uh, whereas they should have perhaps been calculated as deferred income i.e contract liability so we could recalculate the revenue that should have been deferred uh, and of course we can use bank statements which are kind of quite a good source because they're generated by the bank uh, and of course goods delivered notes we could see which payments have actually been delivered to the customer and therefore can correct to have recognized as revenue uh, and which ones uh, should have been recognized as a contract liability because they haven't been delivered. So we could do um, some tracing through there to see which ones uh, have actually been delivered and which haven't. That's always a good procedure to uh, recalculate the amount of deferred revenue. So as I said, it's useful, and we've just touched on it slightly there, but it's useful to think about the sales system at the company when we start thinking about some of our revenue uh, procedures here. So we can have some of kind of our general ones like inquiring with management. We can do some order generated ones like recalculating the revenue and just think about kind of practically how would you do that? You'd obviously need to know which goods have been delivered to the customer and therefore should be recognized and which ones haven't. Uh, so therefore you probably need the goods delivered notes there. Now we're thinking about our revenue procedures it's useful to think about the sales system at the client because if we understand you know, how things work at the client now that's obviously going to help us to understand you know, where there might be issues in the controls so there might be controls weaknesses and it would also kind of help us think of you know how we might use some of this information that's generated in the customs customer sales system to identify risks and think of some sensible procedures there as well so every business is different but what would happen in a typical business and in a business such as this which is providing goods rather than services uh, then a customer would place a sales order so the customer would make an order the goods would then be dispatched and we can kind of see that's what's going on here so a customer places an order goods are then sent out to the customer goods are then of course delivered then a sales invoice would usually be sent. Then a customer would make payment. And if the customer had to return some goods, then there would be like a credit note issued to the customer for those goods returned. So it's kind of like a basic sales system at a client. Of course, that could be different in different businesses. You know, maybe they send the invoice out you know, before, maybe payment is made when they place the order. So it does vary you know, depending on the type of the business. And you know, as we have seen here, these are generally the steps which happen. So then, of course, we know at the client business, you know, the directors there are responsible for creating like internal controls to make sure you know, things operate as they are supposed to. But the company continues um, to safeguard the assets and reduces any kind of appropriation and reduces the risk of you know, transactions not being recorded correctly in the financial statements. So what usually happens, the customer places the order and the goods are dispatched. So when the goods are dispatched, so the goods that are dispatched usually agreed back to the sales order. So that would just be making sure that 
the goods that the customer actually ordered are the ones which are sent out to the customer. So they don't get the, the wrong goods or the business doesn't send out goods at a, too, at a higher value than what's actually being paid for. So that makes sense. And then for documentation, you know, the dispatch notes are usually numbers as a record of which goods have been sent out to customers. So then the goods are delivered to the customer. So they're usually signed for by the customer. So the customer would confirm they've received the goods by signing for them. And then it'd be like a delivery note issue to you know, the customer as well. So the customer would sign for them and then they would have their delivery notes. So that would be like a record that the goods have actually been delivered to the customer. And we said with this business, that's usually when they could recognize the revenue. So then when the goods have been signed for and they've been delivered and the sales invoice is sent a request for payment, and that should be agreed back to the sales order to make sure the invoice agrees back to the goods that were actually ordered. And of course, that agreed to the dispatch note. So that should also, at least all these documents should tie in. So the invoice should agree back to the sales order, what was ordered, what was sent out, which of course has already been agreed back to the sales order, to the delivery note to making sure you know that was actually what was delivered, and the price lists to making sure that you know, the, the prices are correct on there. And then there would be like a regular review of any dispatch notes, any goods which have been dispatched, which haven't been matched by an invoice. So they might have been sent out for some reason, maybe they haven't been delivered, or is there a reason why the invoice hasn't been sent yet? So again, make sure that the company hasn't sent out goods that it isn't going to receive payment for. So again, as an internal control, you'd expect to see that regular review. And then a customer actually makes the payment. Um, so therefore, that's when the company receives uh, the cash. And then the cash receipt should be matched to the invoice to make sure you know, that the payment is being allocated to the correct invoice. So therefore, that customer would be removed from uh, any receivables list. There should be like a segregation of duties as well uh, to reduce the risk of uh, fraud. Uh, and any overdue amounts on the receivables list should be followed up. Uh, and then if there is going to be a bad debt write-off, then that, of course, should be uh, authorised appropriately by the appropriate uh, level of management. So you can see the internal controls that the company should have around this and the types of documents which are generated. And then, of course, when goods are returned, the goods should be checked. There should be an authorization for any credit notes. Uh, and there should be a provision as well for any uh, expected returns. So it's useful to kind of understand this. Uh, kind of high level what typically goes on in a business obviously as i've said it varies from business to business but it then helps us think about some audit procedures we can use around revenue so some of the general procedures that can be used you know, on the sales system would be to inspect the delivery note to see if the delivery to the customer was made in the current period and that would help us see if cutoff has been applied correctly because we said you know there's lots of deliveries at the year end so there's a risk that revenue would be recorded in the incorrect period because it's goods delivered by the year end that should be included in revenue so how would you make sure that this revenue number only includes goods which were delivered before the year end well, you could take like a sample of transactions. So, you know, this will be made up of lots of different revenue transactions. So you could take a sample of the transactions and match them back to the delivery note to see if it was delivered in the current year. So that would help generate evidence and give us some comfort that actually all of the amounts in here are for goods which were delivered in the current period. And it'd probably help us identify as well if some of those cash payments that have been received have just been recorded in revenue, because of course they wouldn't have a delivery note if they hadn't been delivered. So inspect, um, so you could say a sample of transactions, but you know, inspect delivery notes to see if uh, delivery to customer, you know, was in the current period and that would help ensure that they were recorded in the correct period. So that would definitely be a procedure that would help us here. And like I've said before, you could think about you know, which assertion are we attesting. You know, it can be useful to think about that. And obviously that's helping us um, with you know, cutoff to ensure correct cutoff. You don't always have to state you know, which assertion we are testing. 
So if you think about this procedure, so trace revenue transactions back to the invoice, you know, the dispatch you note know, and the original sales order. Of course, all of these should agree. You know, customer places the order, yeah, you know, that should agree to the dispatch note, what they've ordered, and then the invoice should of course agree to the sales order, you know, and the dispatch note. So could we trace some revenue transactions back to like the invoices? Uh, so if you think about this, you know, we've got all of the revenue transactions recorded here. And of course, you've got like the underlying source document, which is like the invoice. Um, so, you know, we'd probably have like a number of invoices where we'd have lots, wouldn't we? 10,000 orders. Uh, maybe just to be have a simple example here. Let's just assume that there were like 10 orders uh, and they were all of, you know, this amount. So you'd have all the the underlying invoices. Obviously, there's like 10,000 in this business. Um, so uh, significantly uh, more, but um, you know, if we imagine that you had all of these uh, invoices here, it's kind of underlying, kind of like supporting this data. These are like the source documents. You know, how would that help kind of support this uh, number? Well, if you started with the revenue number here and you kind of trace these back, then you could see whether that is. Uh, overstated you know or not so we could start with the revenue transactions trace them back to the invoice and if we could see that this number is supported by all of the you know different uh, invoices uh, then of course we would see that actually it isn't uh, overstated now of course if we then traced it back to all of the individual invoices and there were only invoices for you know these amounts and a total of this then that would show that actually there must be some revenue transactions which aren't supported by an invoice. So we trace all of the individual transactions back one by one to the source document uh, of the invoice. And you can see that, that we'd end up with a transaction which doesn't match back because we've only got to a total uh, of this. So then that would be testing for an overstatement. So think, make sure you think about the direction of the testing as well so are you testing for an overstatement if you're testing for an overstatement so you're basically saying the amount in the financial statements is more than what it should be then if you start with the financial statements number and then go back to here because you're what you're essentially saying is you think you know the risk is that you know this number in here is higher than what's going to be in the underlying source documents in the invoices you know invoice one two three four five six you know going through all of these invoices so if you think this number is overstated, if there's a risk of an overstatement, this number's higher than the sort than the sum of all of the source documents. So if you start with this number and trace it back to all of these, then you you would identify an overstatement because this number is going to be lower than this number, and then you'd say this is the you know overstatement. Of course, if you you were doing it the other way and you were looking for an understatement, so if you're looking for an understatement of revenue then what you'd be saying, I think the risk is that this number is too low and this number is too high. Well, sorry, that this number is too low is the risk. And if we'd be expecting if that risk is correct and that misstatement has happened, then this number you'd expect would be higher than this number. So you'd start with this number and then trace them through and then you'd work out the missing number. So think about the direction of the testing. Because if we're concerned about an overstatement, which we are here, and we're saying that we're going to start with this number and trace it back, if you did it the other way and you started with these numbers and you trace them all through, then you'd agree them all. You'd say, yes, this one's included in there, this one's included in there, they're all included in there. But then you haven't identified the fact that this is less than this and therefore this is overstated. So think about which way you're doing the testing to identify the misstatement. That's really kind of important. So think about, are you testing for an overstatement or an understatement? So then clearly this would be a good procedure to do here, because as I said, you know, trace the revenue transactions back uh, to like the invoice. I mean, you could trace it back to all of them because then there'll be the like delivery notes as well. And the sales order could possibly even use some data analytics there to do that if we had a download of the revenue transactions and you know, the invoices and the dispatch notes and the sales order then we could kind of match them all together using data uh, analytics uh, but like i said think about the the, the the direction of the testing so if we're looking for an overstatement we're obviously concerned that this number is higher than this number 
So therefore you start with the transactions which make up this. So you'd have the list of the transactions there and match them to the invoice. And then you would see here that there's one left and therefore you've identified that overstatement. If you do it the other way, you won't identify it. But if you're starting with the invoices, you'd say this invoice is included, this invoice is included, and you'd include them all. But what you wouldn't identify is that revenue transaction which isn't matched by an invoice. So think about which way round you're testing, which one are you starting with and what are you agreeing back to. So if you're doing an overstatement, you're starting with the number in the financial statements and going back to the source documents. If it's an understatement, you'll start with the source documents and go through to the financial statements. Just a bit of a common sense uh, check there, thinking about which way round you would do it. So in this type of procedure, so vouch the revenue receipts to the bank statements. So you could get these revenue amounts and make sure that all the cash was received by it in the bank. So the issue with that one here is, you know, again, don't just list these procedures out. I think I've seen this before. I'll do this again. Now, is it relevant here? What would we actually achieve by doing this? We've kind of said one of the issues here is that, you know, the company's receiving payment from customers and the mistake that they're making is they're recording it in revenue. So if we start with the revenue and we go back to the bank statements, then if they have been making this error, then we would just agree it because we just say, okay, revenue agrees to what's been recorded in the bank statement. All that really shows us is that, yes, they have been making this mistake or it doesn't even necessarily confirm that they have been making that mistake, but it doesn't kind of help us confirm whether this is uh, – materially correct or not because if they have been making this error that's not going to kind of help us identify the amount of the error or anything like that at all because we're saying the mistake they've made is debit cash credit revenues so if we just start with revenue and check it to the bank statement then that's not going to help us identify whether this amount is materially correct or not because if they've made that mistake then that's obviously just going to be in the bank statement as well because they received the cash so that one isn't quite relevant here so what procedures, what better procedure could we do here? Well, we could take a sample of these payments. So they've received, so we can get the bank statement so we can see where that debit cash has come from. So we have a bank statement with all the list of the transactions. And when the company has received cash and when it is for a deposit, you know, maybe we'd have it in like the payment reference or something like that, or it's coded in a certain way. When they receive the deposit, we could trace it through to make sure it's initially recorded as a contract liability until the goods are delivered. So that would help us you know, ensure that the uh, amounts have been accounted for correctly. So we could um, trace sample of deposit payments and ensure recorded as liability until goods delivered to the customer. So again, that would be like a better kind of procedure there and that would help us see if they've actually been accounting for this deferred income as contract liability correctly. So again, you can kind of see, you know, based on the scenario, based on the business type as well and, and their type of internal controls uh, and the way that the sales system works, as well as the risk in the scenario, you can think about what procedures would actually help you uh, kind of support a specific like assertion or would help you identify whether these amounts are materially correct or the amount of the misstatement. So again, like I said, you know, you can think as well back to the assertions. If you need to think of, you know, ideas, you know, you can keep going through these, you know, you could do a data analytics for a three-way match, uh, as we kind of said, between the invoice, the dispatch note and the sales order. Um, and if they didn't all agree, you know, we know the invoice um, is only raised when it's been dispatched, but the sales order is presumably produced when the customer makes the order. And that would actually help us identify the amount of, deferred income because you'd expect them not to completely match because we know the customer places the order. So the sales order is generated, but then we know it can be several months before the goods are actually dispatched in the invoice rate. So the difference between those should be the deferred income. So do a three way match between the invoice dispatch note and sales order, uh, should help identify deferred you know, income, uh, you know, goods not delivered, i.e. deferred income. You know, contract liability. 
So then some of these are around you know, tracing credit notes. There's no point really talking about credit notes, I don't think. I mean, you could mention maybe one or two, you know, inspect post year end cash payments for any refunds and compared to the returns provision. You could maybe mention like one or two of those, but that's not really the main thing in the scenario. That's not the main issue here about like returns and like provisions for returns and uh, you know, post year in credit notes. There's no mention really here about the kind of goods being returned or anything like that. Um, so, you know, that wouldn't be where I would focus on. I'd focus on the issues which are most prominent in the scenario, which was clearly, you know, reasons why gross profit margin may have gone up, how, you know, procedures around how this deposit has been accounted for, and of course, issues around cutoff. So, you know, as I've said, you know, you could think, you know, if you're struggling for thinking of risks or procedures or maybe even looking for weaknesses in the previous auditor's work, you, know, you can't think about, you know, what assertion is being tested by the procedure. You know, think about the action we're going to do. Is it going to be inspect? Is it going to be like trace? Is it going to be, uh, you know, recalculate? You know, something where the auditor is actually doing something rather than just like watching you know, observation is quite weak just like watching you know the client do something instead if we're doing something more active like recalculating expecting like tracing the transaction through the system is um yeah better and think about the source you know, independent is better than the clients as we said before you know if you use delivery notes because they're probably signed by the customer as well if you're using like bank statements um you know it's generally a better source than the client but that's not to say you can't you know, sometimes a client, like the management team, the directors at the company are best placed to answer questions, you know, particularly on like commercial issues in the business. And then what does it help us confirm? So you might think about some of the assertions here. Uh, you know, obviously, as we said, if you were to inspect the delivery notes and you'd then be able to see if they were recorded in the correct period. Um, so you could say, you know, inspect delivery notes for sample of revenue transactions, you know, in the year. And if the delivery was to the customer, then that would help show that they were recorded in the correct period. And we kind of said that that's one of the risks here is that there are lots of deliveries around the year end. So that kind of supports cutoff. Uh, that helps test cutoff. You don't always have to say which assertion you're testing, but I think it can be useful to think about, you know, which assertion are you test testing. It help you probably get the direction of the testing correct, uh, and it will help you kind of cover the most you know, important issues in the scenario. Um, so if we were to do things like trace revenue transactions back to the invoice uh, and the dispatch notes, uh, then that would, of course, help confirm that the transactions have actually occurred, like these revenue transactions, you know, that there was actually a sale of goods because you can trace it back to the invoice, you know, the dispatch note and the uh, sales order. So that would probably help us confirm that the transactions uh, have actually uh, occurred. Uh, and then we could think so tracing a sample of deposit payments and ensuring they've been recorded as a liability in the financial statement. And that's going to help us test classification that these transactions have been classified correctly in the financial statements. So as I've said, you know, we don't need to go through and say exactly which one you're testing. But, you know, these were kind of like the biggest issues in the scenario. Cutoff was an issue. How they're accounting for that, those payments in advance was clearly an issue. Uh, and then we thought about just making sure we're looking at overstatement here. So we'd be concerned whether these transactions uh, have actually occurred. Completeness is probably when we're more looking at an understatement. So you'd be uh, making sure that all of the transactions have been recorded. So if there's a concern that you know, there have been transactions which aren't recorded at all, i.e. that the financial statements would be understated, uh, that's when we would probably be more concerned about completeness and we'd be starting with the source documents and making sure that all of these transactions have been recorded here. So that's when the direction of testing would be the other way if we're looking at an understatement. Um, we could do some work around the accuracy. There wasn't kind of too much around the accuracy, although I guess we've we have done some accuracy testing when we're saying you know, recalculating the amount uh, that should have been, you know, recorded as revenue. So we kind of covered that uh, assertion. So it's useful to think about that. Um, presentation, probably not thinking too much about disclosures, although we kind of touched on that as well, saying that, you know, some of these should be recorded uh, as contract liabilities. So you can see it is useful to think about the assertions. You don't need to do this every time. You don't need to say with every risk. 
uh, you know, what assertions are at risk. Um, and we, you don't need to say with every procedure, you know, which assertion are you testing, but it is useful to almost kind of keep it in the back of your mind, I think, and think, you know, what are we testing here? You know, have I covered off the main assertions for this particular um balance and you don't need to cover every assertion every time but it's useful to think about them because then you can think about which ones are you know most relevant clearly cut off clearly classification you know and clearly you know occurrence here were most relevant and you can think about some procedures which cover them all off so it'll kind of help you think about which ones uh, are relevant and like i said particularly with revenue and purchases it's important to think about like the system at the client business and this will differ. This is just kind of like a hypothetical example of a very standard uh, kind of business supplying goods, but if they're supplying services and obviously it would be different and there's not going to be goods dispatched, but there might be some other documentation around which services have been performed. Uh, and of course, you know, things can happen at a different point in time, like sales invoices being sent, um, you know, maybe kind of before sometimes goods being dis dispatched or services provided or payment might be, you know, in advance, as we saw here, you know, payment didn't come after the invoice payment then started coming earlier. And then thinking about when the transaction should be recorded in the financial statements or in the PL at least. So when should it be recorded as revenue? When should it be recorded as a purchase? And I think once you've understood that at the client business, it then helps you a lot with, some of the procedures i think particularly with some of these procedures around the sales system and around the purchases system uh, which we'll look at in a in a subsequent class but i think some of the procedures around this people just copy them out a bit blindly they don't actually really think about what are they testing for so students often don't think about what are they testing for and they don't think about which direction are they doing the testing and what is it they're supporting I think once you actually, it's almost a little bit like common sense, you know, once you understand like the accounting treatment and you understand like the documents which are like underlying them, it's kind of common sense, a lot of these tests and, you know, why it helps you support whether an amount is you know, kind of overstated uh, or understated. So it's really important you kind of think it through. The examiners always set up kind of different scenarios, different businesses, and therefore you need to kind of have an understanding of what the business is, how the systems work the types of internal controls as well that we might expect there because we might be thinking about whether we can rely on those controls but once you've understood the process in the business then you can think of some procedures that will uh, help you identify whether there is you know, a material misstatement and the amount and of course to get comfort that some of the balances uh, may be materially correct the requirement also wanted us to look at receivables so as well as looking at revenue we also needed to look at receivables it included the two together there so always important to focus on the requirement wording because it would be a shame to miss this out there'd probably be a few easy marks here and of course we were told some information in the scenario about credit terms and we were told that they were 30 days and of course we've also identified some audit risks in revenue and we could think as well whether they might then feed into receivables. Although we thought what was causing the overstatement in revenue was actually uh, receipts of cash. So therefore it doesn't appear as though that the overstatement and revenue will also lead to an overstatement on receivables as well. Because of course, what was causing the overstatement in revenue related to cash receipts. But of course, in other questions, it could. If they were recognising revenue too early and the other side was a receivables entry, then of course that would also cause the overstatement in receivables. So of course, again, you know, as we have said before, what we should try to do is use some analytical procedures where we can. And if we're looking at receivables, obviously the obvious thing to calculate would be receivables days particularly when we've got the standard credit terms so we can see whether the receivables days are in line with those so again you could look at the increase overall in receivables uh, but of course if you know, revenue has gone up you would expect that to have gone up as well so we could possibly look at you know the movement in receivables and it's gone up considerably more than revenue so that of course 
isn't what we would expect. In fact, we might even expect receivables to go up at a lower rate than revenue because, of course, now more sales are for an upfront cash payment and therefore the amount of each sale that's going on credit is actually lower. But of course, we can look at the receivables days as well. And of course, we can see here that they have uh, increased. And as I just said, that's certainly contrary to what we would expect because we would probably expect them to decrease because now more of each sale is for cash. You've got the individual customers paying 40% upfront. So therefore, the amount of each sale that's going to be a receivable uh, will be lower. So of course, we can identify the audit risk just as we have done before, just as we did for revenue. So we can say you know, there is a risk of uh, overstatement because, and then we can use the results from our analytical procedures. Uh, so there is a risk that receivables uh, are overstated uh, because receivables days have increased to 37.8 from 33.7 you know, in the prior year. And of course, you know, receivables days isn't always the best metric to look at, particularly in a business which experiences seasonality such as this business. So obviously if most of the sales are towards the end of the year, then the receivables balance at the end of the year is gonna be higher than it usually is throughout the rest of the year. But of course that applies to both years. So this is kind of a like for like comparison. So even if it isn't you know, representative of the typical receivables balance throughout the year because of the seasonality impact, it is still a good comparison to make. And we can see that, you know, receivables days are increasing. So the risk that receivables are overstated because receivables days have increased from 37.8 uh, to 37.8 from 33.7 and would expect them to decline given that uh, cash is now paid up front on individual orders or on orders uh, from individuals. So we can make that point there. And you could also mention as well, it is above the credit terms. As you say, you know, also um, receivables days above standard credit terms. So that would suggest that if receivable, they could be overstated. Maybe they need to be impaired. You know, is there the possibility that you know, some sales have been recognized um, you know, incorrectly perhaps as well? But it certainly would appear that you know, receivables might need uh, to be impaired. Uh, and it could be, as we've said, that some sales um, perhaps shouldn't have been recognized. We've already addressed some issues there around revenue being overstated. And that would, of course, lead to the overstatement in revenue. And we'd probably pick quite a lot of that up once we started to trace revenue transactions back to like the invoice and the dispatch note and the sales order. So we wouldn't repeat those same procedures there if you are required to do revenue and receivables in the same question, or if you're required to do like cost of sales, i.e. purchases uh, and payables in the same question. So we'd always try to uh, avoid uh, repeating it ourselves there. But if you think some of our typical procedures around receivables, so we could inquire with management to establish uh, reasons why. So yeah, that would be a, a good procedure. Uh, so inquiry of management established commercial reasons why receivables days above the standard credit terms and why they haven't reduced given that uh, sales or sales to individual customers uh, have required a, an upfront deposit since October. So you'd expect them to reduce. So again, just tailoring that procedure to the specific scenario. It's a good procedure inquiring with management to find out commercial reasons, but you make sure you tailor it to the specific scenario by you know, mentioning some of those points I've just mentioned there. So of course we said, you know, we'd have the list of, you know, receivables, probably have a receivables ledger for each customer. So you could use data analytics to identify like the aged amounts so the amounts which have now exceeded 
uh, the credit term. So that would be a, a good procedure to do because then we can identify all of the amounts which are more than that. Uh, we can see if management have undertaken an impairment test for receivables and looked at the bad debt allowance. Uh, so we could obtain that, inspect it, and then re-perform that calculation to make sure they have tested this asset for impairment. The fact that receivables days uh, are higher than standard credit terms would suggest that some receivables might need to be impaired. As we said, you know, a great source for our audit procedures is to use an external source, so obtain customer confirmation of balances and reconcile with receivables. Um, so obtain correspondence from each of the customers confirming the balance that they own CCL. So that would be like an excellent uh, audit procedure because obviously the source uh, is independent and then the auditor is being active as well by reconciling it with the receivables balance. If there are overdue amounts, then you could inspect any correspondence between CCL and the customer to see if those amounts are going to be paid. Could inspect the credit policy and just make sure that it is 30 days. We were obviously told up here that it was 30 days, but we could inspect that credit policy to ensure that it is. Another good one would be to inspect post-year transactions to see if payments made. So they've got these receivable balance on the SFP, of course, we're now past the year end. You know, you know never forget that, that we're now you know, after the year end, after this date. So actually a good source of evidence, if there's you know, a receivable in this case, a good source of evidence would be to inspect after the year end, were these amounts actually paid? And therefore that would obviously support the fact that they were receivables at the year end. Uh, probably not. Uh, credit notes will be not such an issue uh, in this question. And in fact, we've already got enough procedures. I mean, that's plenty there. You know, I've probably listed about you know seven or eight uh, procedures there that we could use uh, when looking at receivables. Now, I always tailor them to the specific scenario, but kind of quite a lot of them, as I've said before, you know, can be used in most cases. They're good procedures there for receivables. And again, you might want to think about you know, the assertions when you're thinking of some of the procedures. Um, so if you were thinking about particular assertions, uh, you know, as we've said, thinking about the you know, bad debt allowance and the uh, impairment test and identifying the aged amounts. And obviously we're thinking about, you know, the accuracy and evaluation uh, of those receivables there, getting the customer confirmations or balances, you know, that will confirm that these assets, you know, do actually exist and that the uh, CCL is actually due that money and that will ensure the uh, rights uh, over them as well. So again, you can see, you know, it's useful to think about the assertions, maybe just keep them in the back of your mind. Um, but, you know, always, of course, with your procedures, keeping them very specific to the scenario. So, yeah, we could have had you know, most of uh, you know those procedures there would be quite relevant. But, yeah, as I have said before, you know, always making sure that we are using a scenario uh, as much as possible. So there's definitely more to do with revenue there. And as I said, you know, some of the procedures we undertook on revenue, such as you know, tracing the revenue transactions back to the invoice, of course, to the extent that they've been recorded as receivables. So if it's a revenue, so credit revenue, debit, receivable, when the goods are delivered, then of course, that's also supporting the receivables balance. So I wouldn't necessarily repeat some of these transactions, but then of course, there are you know, different amounts, uh, different procedures that we could undertake on the receivables themselves as well. So the next area that we needed to look at was plant and equipment. And we're told here that on the 23rd of January, 22, so quite close to the start of the year, CCL acquired a new carpet manufacturing machine. So of course we know that we've got some PPE information here and we can see that we've got additions here and they're significantly higher than the previous year. So it's how they acquired a new carpet manufacturing machine. So presumably that's what we are seeing here. The cost of the machine, delivery costs, management time, marketing overheads, and installation costs were all capitalized in non-current assets. So 
we can see what they've capitalized in respect of the machine is the cost of the machine. And again, if you think back to your FAR and accounting knowledge, what can be capitalized when company acquires a new asset? Well, it's the cost of the asset plus any directly attributable costs under IS-16 or under IS-38 if we're looking at intangibles. So we've got the cost of the machine. That obviously capitalized. That's the cost of the machine itself. Delivery costs, they should be capitalized because they're directly attributable. So thinking, did those costs have to be incurred in order to bring the asset into working use? Cost of the machine, obviously, yes. Yes, it would have to be delivered. Management time probably depends what that's for, but probably not. Marketing overheads, definitely not. They didn't need to incur any you know, marketing costs in order to buy a machine and have it working. And installation costs, you know, they could be capitalized. But it certainly seems as though that some of these costs shouldn't have been capitalized. So they've all been capitalized as non-current assets. So that would, of course, cause PPE to be overstated, but also a profit to be overstated as well, because um, those amounts which have been capitalized. So again, if you think back to your double entry, you know, the company would have, um, when it acquired the machine, no credit payable or, you know, credit cash. Uh, and then it's obviously debited asset, whereas for some of those costs, it should have debited expense. Some of those costs shouldn't have been capitalized. So the assets overstated, but also because they didn't debit the expense, your know, profit has ended up being overstated as well because the expense is understated. So there's clearly a risk there about costs not being expensed or, or costs being incorrectly capitalized. We're told the accounting policy is to depreciate production machinery, which clearly this is, on a 20% reducing balance basis. So we can see what the depreciation policy is, and therefore we could maybe look at the depreciation charge. And it's on a reducing balance basis, so we could look at it as a proportion of the carrying amount. Straight away, that 500 looks to be kind of about uh, 20% there because obviously 10% would be 250 and then that's 500. So that looks as though depreciation kind of 20% of the opening carrying amount and therefore you know, that maybe this asset hasn't been depreciated at all. This is obviously 20% of the opening carrying amount for that year, but there weren't any significant additions. So therefore that looks as though perhaps that new asset hasn't been depreciated. So again, that would be an overstatement of the asset and an, and an overstatement of profit via the understatement of an expense. So proposed climate related legislation could require CCL to replace all its existing production machinery with more environmentally friendly equipment by 2025. So it looks as though new legislation hasn't come in yet, but potential new legislation could require CCL to replace all its production machinery with new equipment in a few years. And therefore perhaps a question about whether this depreciation policy needs to change because it sounds like the useful life of their current asset of the um, current PPE is going to be lower because you know, they might only be able to use them now for a few more years but you know we'll have to uh, that, that seems to be un, a little bit uncertain uh, but definitely a potential uh, audit risk there so straight away we can see quite a few audit risks coming from the scenario Let's work with the numbers as well with what we're given here. Um, you know, like I said, you could look at the carrying amount brought forward, look at the depreciation charge as a proportion of that. So the carrying amount brought forward is this, depreciation charge is this. Um, so we could see there that it's yeah, kind of 21% the depreciation charge of the brought forward uh, carrying amount there. Um, so that's the additions depreciation charge 5.3. Uh, so 20.6. And then we've got the depreciation charge for the previous year. And of course, there weren't significant additions in the previous year. So it looks as though they're kind of calculating depreciation you know, as a percentage of the brought forward amount. But yeah, if this asset was acquired at the start of the year, what we would expect depreciation to be would be like the 2486. So I kind of guess it would be that plus the uh, 524 and then you, it would be depreciated at 20%, you know, for roughly yeah, 11 months of the 
of the year. I guess it depends when it w- was actually ready for use, uh, which is what we aren't told. But you'd expect to see some depreciation on it. So it looks as though there might be around just under 100k of depreciation effectively uh, missing here because you know, these are the brought forward assets. You know they'll be depreciated at 20%. Then there's this new asset which should also be being depreciated 20%, you know, be, be depreciated when it's ready for use. So it isn't really clear in the scenario. It doesn't say anything that it wasn't you know, immediately ready for use. So that's probably something we'd need to find out. And of course, you could like inquire with management or you could you know, inspect some documentation of when that asset was first used. So it clearly looks as though costs were inc- incorrectly capitalized initially anyway. So some of those should have been recorded as an expense. Then it appears as though you know the asset hasn't been depreciated. And it appears as though as well that useful economic lives need to be revised. So we can say again, uh, there is a risk. Um, and you could mention both at the same time. So you could say there is a risk that you know assets uh, are overstated. I guess we're not really looking at profit in this question. They have asked us to focus on PPE, but you could say uh, the assets are overstated. Uh, you could put here, you know, expenses understated, uh, you know, slash profit uh, overstated. Uh, it's worth just thinking about, you know, the entry is wrong on one side. Is it wrong on the other side as well? And therefore, you know, it's is there another balance which is is also uh, potentially misstated, either over or understated. You know, as a result. But it's a risk that assets are overstated, expenses understated or profit overstated. Uh, because, and again, we've kind of got a few here. So you could have it all as one, but that's going to be quite a lengthy paragraph like we did with revenue. If I had all this as just one point, it would get very long. So you might want to, yeah, is it an overstatement or an understatement risk? And then because, and then you can kind of break it out into uh, each reason. But we said the first one, first of all, it appears as though uh, that non-directly attributable uh, costs uh, have been you know, capitalized. That's the, the first bit. And again, don't be shy about using your FAR knowledge, you know, like we did with revenue. The only cost for PPE which should be capitalized when acquiring PPE are the cost of the PPE plus any directly attributable costs. You know that from when you've done your uh, assets when looking at, you know, the explain the IFRS treatment questions in FAR. So, only directly attributable costs should be capitalized, but you know costs which aren't directly attributable uh, have been capitalized. And you could put here, yeah, e.g., the one we definitely knew there was marketing overheads. It probably depends a little bit what the management time was actually spent on, uh, but you know, probably should be expensed. So it looks as though they're understated because uh, non-directly attributable costs yeah, have been capitalized. That's the first issue. You know, PP is overstated because they've included uh, costs here which shouldn't have been capitalized. Uh, and then you know, subsequent treatment for PP, of course, is the asset would then be depreciated. And of course, it looks as though that you know, depreciation is incorrect. So you could say uh, it appears uh, the new machine. And of course, we don't know if that's the only amount in additions. We're not told the exact amount. So, you know, again, if there's some more information we need, that's something we could have in our uh, audit procedures. Uh, but we could say, you know, it appears a new machine. Uh, has not been uh, depreciated because uh, depreciation is, and we've seen it is, you know, 513K, which is 20.6% of the brought forward carrying amount, as we worked out there, uh, and would expect to see um, depreciation of around, and we can copy our workings over at the end, of around 96K for new uh, addition. Uh, But that depends on when it is um, ready for use. But it was acquired at the start of the year. And, you know, as far as we know, it would have been ready for use kind of near then. You wouldn't expect it to be a long wait, uh, particularly with a a machine. So that's another risk. And also the useful economic lives as well. Uh, you know, may not be uh, appropriate uh, and as a result of that climate change legislation. So they might need to be revised down as well. So that would mean that you know, depreciation wouldn't be for this new machine, uh, 20% reducing balance. You know, maybe it needs to be depreciated over the next three years. And therefore, you know, depreciation would obviously be much higher per year. So again, these are some, you know, typical risks we see um, with assets. But again, just always kind of you know, thinking 
you know, can we use some numbers in this scenario? Can we perform some analytical procedures? You know, what should we be looking for here? And again, you know, letting the scenario kind of uh, guide us there. Uh, but it could be that, you know, additions are high compared to the previous year and therefore, you know, amounts incorrectly capitalized, which we've picked some up there. Depreciation expense could be low. Uh, if the if there's a profit or loss on disposal, then that would indicate that the useful economic lives, uh, the period of being depreciated over is incorrect because obviously, ideally, you depreciate the asset. So it's it, when it gets to its amount that you sell it for, that should be equal to its you know, residual amount that you use when you first calculated the depreciation. Revaluation is a common one. We haven't seen that here, but of course that's a judgmental exercise. So there's kind of lots of procedures we could do there around that. Um, you know, costs which should and shouldn't be capitalized. So again, you really need to think back to your FAR knowledge here, you know, both for tangibles and also intangibles as well, because there's development costs and there's that strict criteria there that need to be met under IS38 in order for development or well, research and development costs or the development side of that being capitalized um so again you know thinking is it an overstatement or an understatement and then using the numbers and using the scenario as much as possible which is what we've done here and even though you know the risks are quite common across businesses and therefore across exam questions always trying to use that scenario as much as possible you know use examples uh you know, climate related legislation and marketing overheads Keep your eyes very specific to the scenario and focus on you know risk, which are obvious coming from the scenario, both the narrative and the numbers here. Don't think, oh, I've done lots of questions on assets, so I'm just going to you know write out all of the risks I can remember from last time. That isn't going to work, and your answer isn't going to be specific to the scenario. It'll probably be wrong as well, because maybe this time you're looking at an understatement, or maybe this time, maybe next time more of the risk is around you know an asset revaluation. So whilst the technique is the same, you know, the answer isn't the same every time. And then again, we could think about, you know, some of our procedures we could undertake to address these risks. Uh, but if we're concerned that non-directly attributable costs have been capitalized, then a really good procedure for that would be to inspect the schedule of costs which were capitalized and ensure they meet the capitalization criteria. That would be a good thing to do if, for you as an accountant. You could go through the list of costs that they've capitalized. So there'll be a list of you know, what they've recorded. So the cost of the machine, however much, the insulation, you know, however much, and marketing overheads, however much. And then you can see which costs should have been capitalized and which shouldn't have been capitalized, i.e. which are directly attributable and which aren't. Um, and then you can see, you know, which amounts should have been expensed and you could advise management to... Um, put through the correcting journal so that would be a good one and again if you're thinking about your uh, assertions then that would be a good one to ensure that they've got the correct those costs have got the correct classification um that you know they should have been classified as an asset rather than being uh, classified as um an expense so that would kind of help uh, ensure the correct classification and then if we want to be concerned about like the amounts themselves, whether the correct amounts have been included. So we've kind of gone through the list. Um, in, and like we said, you know, you had the cost of the machine, you know, the delivery, um, the you know, overheads, and you, and you kind of have the amounts for each. So we could go through and check the classification is correct by making sure they should have been capitalized as assets. Then if we're concerned about the amounts, are these amounts that they've included correct, like the amount for the machine and the amount for um, like the delivery costs, then you could trace those costs back to like the purchase invoice. Obviously, whoever delivered the machine, would there'd be an invoice for that. There'd be an invoice for the machine itself. If we're looking at staff costs, then you, know, you confirm that back to payroll. Obviously, staff don't send an invoice. Staff wages and salaries, you know, go through the, the payroll system. So that would be a good one. That would help ensure accuracy. Um, so like I said, you don't need to say which assertion you know, every time, but it's kind of quite useful to to think about that. We could help uh, ensure like the accuracy and evaluation uh, of the asset there by tracing back the capitalized costs back to the source documents there. Um, so whichever ones for assets is existent. So you could physically inspect the machine. So physically inspect assets to ensure that exist. You replace that with machine. So physically inspect machine to ensure it exists. And that would be a good one there. Uh, you could always give some examples here. I wouldn't say 
payroll. I did actually say director's cost were director's time was capitalized. Maybe we would look at payroll there. Uh, but yeah, that would be another one. Uh, their existence. What else do we have at the assertions uh, on uh, balance sheet items? Uh, rights. So you could inspect the uh, legal documentation to ensure that they uh, well, they own the asset and therefore they have the control over the asset. Obviously, you don't need to own an asset in order to have control over it. It could be a lease and therefore you can inspect like lease documentation if it was a leased asset. But here, inspect the legal documentation to ensure uh, that they actually do control the asset. And then we've also got the risk about the useful economic life as well. So that might be something where we would get uh, an expert in on the useful economic life, um, you know, maybe like a legal expert about the proposed climate change and the likelihood of it, perhaps the, the climate change legislation, the likelihood of it coming in. And would it require uh, CCL to replace all of their assets and therefore that would help us decide what is the useful life of these assets? Could do some basic ones like use software to recalculate the depreciation charges because it'd be like a list of all the assets the date they were acquired or the date they were acquired and perhaps the date they were ready for use which you know, for most assets should be the same uh, and then the software could recalculate the depreciation charge uh, you know we've obviously had a bit of a rough go at recalculating it in ourselves but the software could do it to make sure all of the amounts are correct this has probably got lots of assets in the brought forward amount lots of different kind of carrying amounts and therefore that would be useful there could see what other companies are doing uh, with their um, how what period they depreciate the assets from. We could, as we've said, obtain documentation to see when the asset was ready for use and to ensure it was depreciated from that date. Because it appears as though that machine hasn't been depreciated at all, so we could get some documentation from when it was ready for use. Um, and that would also kind of help a bit with that would also help with cut off in the PL. Because of course, with the asset. You know, yes, we've got these assets. We thought about existence, rights, you know, asset uh, accuracy classification. But the depreciation charge is recorded in the PL, and we need to make sure it's recorded in the correct period. So, you know, if we're checking when the asset was ready for use and therefore when it should be depreciated, that will ensure that the depreciation charge in the PL is also recorded uh, in the correct period. Although here we were primarily focusing on the PPE balance. So, again, you can see, you know, how these procedures you know would be relevant you know as i've said you know lots of times and i can't overemphasize it enough don't think you just learn the procedures for each balance and they just apply universally to all questions that's absolutely not the case the examiner set the scenarios up in different ways different types of businesses different issues different risks so that that won't work you know you need to think about the specific scenario so this is kind of like a, a useful uh, list to give you an idea of the types of procedures you know you might consider including and giving you an idea of the types of procedures that you can use over assets but of course you know in some questions you know you'll be able to think of your own procedures and in some questions you know some will be more relevant you know rather uh, some will be more relevant than others depending on what the risks are and also depending on you know which um the type of the business and the type of assets that they've got. You know, if we're looking at intangible assets, you're not going to go and physically inspect the assets to ensure they exist. You might inspect documentation showing like rights over the assets though. So again, you know, always having to tailor it to the specific scenario. But you can see there how you know lots of these procedures, I mean I've listed kind of you know eight or nine procedures that we would have here. So kind of more than enough to get us to our full marks there. But as always using the numbers using a scenario to identify the risks and then thinking about specific procedures which could be used to identify those risks, thinking about the types of information that would be available in respect of these assets and the types of costs which were involved, like you know, purchase invoices for the delivery of the machine, and you know, payroll costs for the staff time, and getting an expert opinion on the uh, legislation changes as well. So, you know, always keeping it as specific as possible to the scenario. So the next area we needed to look at was provisions. Now we can see that in January 2023, several customers filed complaints regarding design faults. So there must have been a fault with the design in some of the rugs or carpets. And we can see this happened after the year end. Now, all the complaints related to a particular type of rug, 
delivered between October and December 22. So the period which we are looking at here. So there would have been sales in between October and December 22. In accordance with the warranty policy stated on CCL's website, all customers were offered a refund or replacement. So there's a warranty policy in place. As the complaints were raised after the year end, no entries have been made in the financial statements for the year ended 31st of December 22. So of course we know that the sales were made in the year ended 22. We know that there were sales made under warranty and therefore you would expect the company to have some sort of warranty provision in place. And therefore, given that nothing is recorded in the financial statements, it appears as though there is an understatement there. So there is a risk that provisions are understated uh, because no warranty provision has been recognized uh, despite CCL having a legal obligation. So again, if you think back to your FAR knowledge, you know, when is a provision recognized? Well, a provision is recognized when the company has a legal or a constructive uh, obligation as a result of past events and it's probable that there will be an outflow of economic benefit. So probable, more likely than not, that a company would have to pay money out. So if they're selling goods with like a, you know, a standard warranty, then we would usually expect to see a provision recognized for you know, expected kind of replacement costs under the warranty. And that clearly hasn't uh, happened here. So provisions are understated because no warranty provision has been recognized despite them having a legal uh, obligation. And you could even you know, take it a little bit further. You don't need to go into all the accounting treatment, but you know, having a legal obligation, uh, which will result in future outflow. So as I said before, you know, don't be shy, don't be afraid to show off a bit of your uh, accounting knowledge here, because of course it's the incorrect accounting treatment which often leads to you know the misstatements that we're looking at from the point of view of the auditor you know not always it could be that you know, as i've said before like control weaknesses like they haven't brought through all of the balances or like cut off issues and, and things like that they can be like technically based uh, as it is here so then we could think with some of our procedures you know again we would like to uh, have some procedures that the auditor can you know, generate themselves um, so we could like you know calculate so we could think how would we calculate the amount of provision that should have been recognized at the year end uh, we could calculate like the expected refund or like replacement costs if they're going to have to replace them uh, so replacement costs slash refunds so you know how do you do that what documentation would we need well if it's a particular type of rug sold between this period you could do it based on sales of that rug during that period so calculate uh, future replacement costs slash refunds based on sales of those uh, of that particular rug of that particular rug um you know, between October and December. So if you had the sales data for um, that particular rug between, you know, those two dates, you could see, you know, what how many were sold and therefore you could kind of estimate what the uh, future replacement costs, you know, might be if they're going to replace them uh, or like the future refund costs, what they might be as well if they were to uh, refund them. So it would be a really good kind of order generated one. We could do our usual, you know, inquire with management and ask them the reasons um, for, you know, not making the provision. So that's a procedure. You know, I could speak with management and say, you know, what was the basis for this? You know, clearly there's going to be a, a future outflow uh, there. Uh, another thing to do would be inspect board minutes, and you know, that can be quite a good one. So we could have like inspect board minutes, but again, always tailor it to the scenario. What exactly are you going to be looking for in those board minutes we're not you know that that one there doesn't really kind of make sense so 
for an example, you know, inspect board minutes um, to see if expected you know, outflow uh, discussed, um, to see if they discuss the amount that it might uh, cost. Uh, correspondence is always good. So inspect correspondence. We've got the complaints, haven't we? So you could say inspect um, complaint uh, emails uh, to see, you know, what uh, has been uh, offered to customers. Like we've said here that, you know, the standard warranty policy is that there'd be a refund, a replacement or a refund, but maybe they've offered something else as well. Maybe that needs to be factored into our calculation. Um, so that could be quite useful. And another good one with provisions as well is to review like the post year end payment to assess the accuracy, you know, of, of the provision or, or our calculation here. You know, maybe we said these were received in uh, January. You know, if we were a few months on now, so say like March, April, when we're doing the audit, you know, we might be able to see you know, how many um, replacements were issued and and the cost of those, or uh, if there were uh, refunds issued and and the value of those there. So again, you can see kind of using the scenario, we didn't have any numbers to work with here, and that's of course because they didn't record any provisions. But again, you know, is it an overstatement or an understatement? Reason why from the scenario, and then some very specific procedures based on the scenario. But always thinking, what is it we're going to do? So we calculate, inspect. What's the source of the information? Um, so we could use like the sales data. Uh, we could use like the board minutes. We could use the complaint emails. And what we're we trying to do here, we're kind of checking uh, the accuracy. Here we're trying to calculate the amount of the provision so again kind of like the accuracy uh, and the valuation there um so really trying to kind of value this it seems as though we've pretty much decided that there is going to be uh, a provision that there should be a provision recognized then some of the others you know you could be inspecting you know like the board minutes to see whether there is an obligation or not or inspecting with the lawyers to see whether the payment is probable remember provision is only recognized uh, if uh, it's more likely than not, it would be paid. So seeing if that obligation does actually uh, exist or not at the year end. So again, can be useful to think about uh, the assertions. I think we kind of decided ourselves that there was the uh, obligation here. So it's probably more around uh, the valuation uh, of that. And then we had a similar one here. So a group of former employees uh, have begun legal proceedings against CCL, claiming that they were required to work unpaid overtime. Board of directors believe it's unlikely that the former employees will win the case, so nothing has been recorded in the financial statements. So again, you could say, um, you know, there is a risk that provisions are understated um, because you know no provision has been recorded for the legal case and you know if it is the case it is unlikely and therefore you know it isn't probable if you're thinking back to is 37 if it isn't probable that there will be an outflow and that there will be you know I, more likely than not that there will be a payment in respect to the legal case that it is correct that you, know, you wouldn't recognize a provision possibly disclose a contingent liability um so that's you know something else we could mention there uh, but we could say so again, we could say provisions are understated because, and then you could kind of split this up between the two, because you said about the warranty provision, first of all, uh, but then we could say because no provision uh, has been recognized for, um, you know, legal case. Um, and then you could say, you know, although management believe uh, outflow is unlikely, you know, their opinion you know, may be biased. Because, of course, you know, they may be of the view that it's against the company. Um, they also might not want to record a provision. You know, in some other questions, we're told, you know, there's management, uh, get a bonus based on the profit. You know, we weren't told that in that case, but this could be another reason why they wouldn't want to recognize a provision. So, again, we've said, you know, no provision has been recognized, you know, although management believe the outflow is unlikely, you know, their opinion may be biased. And then, of course, what we would do, you know, a really good one for a provision, particularly when it's a, a legal case uh, such as this, would be to engage an expert uh, such as, you know, a lawyer or inspect correspondence with lawyers to see if a payment is, you know, probable. So that would be a good one uh, here. 
Um, so then we could have uh, inspect or engage uh, legal experts. So it could be like an auditor's expert, engage legal expert to assess if uh, outflow uh, probable. So again, it's good to use the accounting terminology here. What would be what would be required in order for that provision to be uh, recognized? So the previous one was probably more around the value of it. Uh, and here it's probably about whether it's a provision uh, or not in the first place. So here we might be thinking a bit more about uh, is there actually, you know, that obligation there? Is it probable that there will be an outflow? Um, again, could we review uh, correspondence with the company lawyers as well? You know, post year end payments would be uh, a good one as well. Inspect board minutes to see if that's consistent with the explanation provided. They've said I haven't recognised the provision because it's unlikely if you review the board minutes, you know, what are the directors saying in the actual board meetings? Are they saying, are they really saying that this is, you know, unlikely? So again, you know, a different topic area, but same exam technique. Using a scenario, is it a risk of understatement or overstatement? And then the all important because why is there a risk using the numbers from the scenario using the narrative from the scenario and also thinking as well maybe about some of the assertions you know which ones are potentially uh, at risk here and then like i've said you know use your accounting and far knowledge as well to help uh, identify some potential misstatements and therefore it can be quite useful to do these questions when you're doing like your FAR questions as well. You know, if you're focusing on revenue and you're doing your FAR revenue questions, why not do some FAA uh, audit risks and procedures revenue questions as well? You know, you're looking at that topic of revenue, explain the FAR, FAR explain the uh, accounting treatment in FAR and then start doing some audit risks and procedures questions in order if you're doing these two exams together. You can kind of double up and leverage off that knowledge there. So that's what we're doing when we're identifying the audit risks. And then with the procedures, think about what are you doing, source of the information and the purpose. And again, it can be useful to think of the assertions there, which ones are most at risk. And of the procedures you've suggested, you know, have you covered off the main assertions there for that balance or the ones which appear to be most at risk? And therefore, you can see you produce kind of a really full, complete answer. Obviously, I didn't type out all of the procedures for the receivables and the plant. But clearly, you can see you get to the 24 marks here. There's nearly always more available marks and maximum marks for these questions. So even if you don't get kind of every point that was possible to get, you can still get full marks. Uh, this is a question where it is you know, absolutely possible uh, to get full marks on. And we've had you know, several students do really well in AA, you know, well into the 90s. And it's this exam technique, which is kind of really help them get there. So whilst it's useful to have you know, a list of the generic audit risks and procedures for each balance and the types of points to consider including in your answer, make sure you're always focusing on a scenario as much as possible. This is a skills-based exam. It's really important that you use the scenario as much as possible, the numbers and the narratives to generate your points for your answer. You can see here, you know, I've used all of this information in the answer, you know, I use the numbers, I've used like all of the narrative points in the scenario, you know, for all of these topics. And, you know, I've combined that with my technical FAR knowledge uh, to identify risks. And then I've kind of combined it with my financial statement assertion knowledge to generate like audit procedures for each balance. And that's really the key to getting top marks in this exam. So what you can now do is you can go away and if you go to the latest version of our master plan in our AA materials, then we've got a list of questions which examined each topic. So you could go away and just practice the part from each question which tested revenue. You know, we've just been through revenue. You've obviously thought quite a lot about the typical sales system and we've thought about 
typical audit risks and procedures we've seen with revenue. We've worked through a revenue question, of course, looking at the numbers, the gross profit margin, how that can indicate risk, you know, the types of risks we typically see with revenue and the types of procedures you can perform. So you can now go away and practice several questions on revenue, one after the other, and you just see some different scenarios, some different uh, businesses, and therefore they'll have different sales systems. You know, there'll be different issues in the scenario. You know, some might have control weaknesses. Some of them um, might receive payment after they've performed uh, the services. So rather than goods, you might see some services. So see a few different scenarios, uh, and then you can just practice that exam technique. Uh, and then you can do the same for the other topics as well. Um, yeah, not only that we've looked at today, but the other ones as well. So, you know, assets, common one, which comes up quite a lot is inventory as well, you know, cost of sales, payable. So therefore, obviously important to understand that like, the purchasing system uh, at the client business uh, when you're thinking about looking for uh, misstatements in the cost of sales and payables and then thinking about some of the uh, procedures you could use to address that there. So we've covered the exam technique to use for these types of questions. You know, like I said, you can go away and practice several questions on that topic one after the other. And if you're doing FAR as well, you know, why not um, do them on the same day as you're doing like your FAR, your technical accounting revision on that topic? Because as you've seen here, that's going to help you identify audit risk because you know what the correct accounting treatment should be and therefore you'll be able to spot from the scenario when they've done something wrong just as you do in the FAR exam questions so that kind of enables you uh, to do th to two things at once there so you do your FAR for uh, revenue and then do uh, audit risk and procedures for revenue do FAR for assets so your PP and intangibles and then do your audit risk and procedures questions for intangibles and that will kind of really help you build a overall comprehensive understanding of the topic both how the IFRS standards uh, apply to that particular uh, element in the financial statements uh, but then also it help you kind of understand how the business would be recording those types of transactions and therefore kind of what audit procedures you could do and how you could use that information to get comfort that that balance is materially misstated uh it is materially correct and you go do do the same thing so provisions you know do the same far and aa then we could go away uh, do inventory so far and aa and so on and so on but, you know, particularly with audit, really important that you practice lots and lots of questions uh, because it's a skill based exam and therefore, you know, exam technique is absolutely key. So if you go away and you know, practice these questions um, you know, one after the other and just keep practicing this exam technique. And then when you go through after you've done the question, look at the answer and then just look at the, you know, the procedures you've got and then see if there are any others that the examiner's got uh, and you, know, you can think about how they might be relevant to future questions. But, you know, as I said, it's the, the same types of risks and the same procedures do tend to come up. They just, uh, you just need to adjust them slightly for each business.